Hello everyone, my name is Shai Laurent, and today I will present you a piece of work which is related to the numerical simulation of flame dynamics in liquid rocket engine. And more particularly, the flame in which we are interested today is a doubly transcritical flame with liquid oxygen and liquid methane. This work was conducted at Surfax in Toulouse, France, under the supervision of my PhD advisor, Thierry Poinceau, as well as Gabriel Saffelbach and Franck Nicou. You might know that SpaceX, which has recently become the leader on the space launchers market, is planning to send missions to Mars and to the Moon thanks to the Starship, which you can see in this video. So the Starship uh, is, a, is a space launcher which is propelled by the Raptor engine, which is a liquid rocket engine using liquid oxygen and liquid methane. Actually, there are many other actors of the space launchers market who are trying to develop this new liquid methane rocket engine. Because methane has many advantages in comparison to traditional rocket fuels, for instance, it enables a greater reversibility of the engine and a greater ability to be reignited. There is however an issue with the development of this new uh, liquid methane rocket engine is that they are very likely to be impacted by thermoacoustic instability, which is a mechanism that can completely destroy a rocket engine. This uh, thermoacoustic instability, instability phenomenon is the result of an interplay between the combustion process and the propagation and reflection of acoustic wave. A key point is that the doubly transcritical uh, regime where liquid oxygen reacts with liquid methane is actually the subject of very few studies in the literature. So the aim of the present work is to study the flame dynamics in this particular combustion regime, this doubly transcritical regime with liquid methane. So the goal of this work is to use large dissimulation to study the dynamics of a doubly transcritical flame with liquid oxygen and liquid methane. And the common approach to do that is to impose acoustic pulsation at the injector of the combustor. This is obviously very difficult to achieve because of the extreme thermodynamics that are encountered in a liquid rocket engine. And because of these thermodynamics, the fluid is not a real gas, it's not an ideal gas anymore, it's instead something that we call a real gas. A consequence of this difficulty is that the entire FTF of a doubly transcritical flame with, uh, with a liquid methane and liquid oxygen has never been computed before. So that is one of the main objectives of this work. To do so, we choose a very well-known test bench, which is the mascot test bench that you have here on the left, that is operated by EM2C and ONERA, and that is the subject of many previous studies. We also choose uh, a well-validated LES solver, which is the real gas version of AVBP developed at, uh, at Serfax, that is also well-validated for, for real gas combustion in the mascot test bench. And if you want more details about both AVP and mascot, uh, I suggest you to read uh, the, the reference number two on this page, which is a very comprehensive review by Schmidt. So my speech will be divided into two parts. In the first one, I will quickly describe the network setup that we use for the simulations, and I will describe results of uh, unforced large edit simulations that were performed in order to study the flame topology and its structure. In the second part, I will present results of forced large edit simulations to study the flame dynamics with a particular emphasis on the computation and definition of a flame transfer function. For the miracle setup, I will not describe all the, the parameters that we use for the simulation. There are just two of them that I would like to emphasize. The first one is the modeling of the chemistry, for which we use the, a mechanism that was derived from the GR3 mechanism and which contains nine species, uh, seven quasi state species, and 82 reactions. This mechanism was uh, specifically derived and reduced uh, for, uh, for the conditions that are encountered in liquid rocket engine combustion. And you can download this mechanism freely at, uh, at this address there. The second point that I would like to emphasize is the, is the mesh that used for the computation. Uh, it contains 40 million uh, cephalidal cells, and it was generated thanks to the, an adaptive mesh refinement strategy with the MMG uh, 3D library. So first, before looking into the, the dynamics of this flame, we first need to be able to understand its, uh, its structure and its topology. And to do that, we perform a first LES, where we don't impose any acoustic modulation at the, at the injector. And here we can see some, uh, some average fields that were obtained with this unforced LES. So first of all, you can see that this flame is, is very different from a, from a typical gaseous flame. One of the first things you can notice is those red regions there that corresponds to a contour of, uh, of heat capacity, which means that the pseudo boiling of O2 and methane is happening in, within those, uh, those red regions. 
And because of this slow boiling, there is a sudden decrease of the density of, a, of, the, of the dense O2 core in the middle. This sudden drop in the O2 density uh, creates radial momentum that contributes to the deviation of the methane jet outwards, as you can see in green there. So the methane jet is, uh, is deviated outwards, and then it impacts on the sidewall of the chambers, which creates those two strong recirculation zones, with here in the middle the central recirculation zone, and on the side, the lateral recirculation zone. Then, because of those two uh, strong recirculation zones, uh, the flame is actually very confined, and it's relatively narrow, with an opening angle of 5 degrees. And uh, the methane jet is also relatively confined, and is narrow, with an opening angle of 17 degrees. As a result, the flame is long, uh, with a length of about 13 times the diameter of the O2 injector. That brings us to the second part of my pitch, in which I will describe the results of the fourth LES, and in particular, of the computation of the flame transfer function. This work had three requirements. Uh, the first one is that we wanted to see the, the flame response to uh, acoustic perturbation in the fuel inflow. So we imposed harmonic uh, acoustic modulation at the methane injector. The second requirement is that we wanted to see the flame response over a large range of, of frequency. So we performed 16 distinct LES, forced LES, uh, with frequencies, with forcing frequencies going from 1 kHz to 20 kHz. The third requirement is that we wanted to, to study the, the linear flame response. And to that, we imposed a very low uh, modulation amplitude of 2.5% of the bulk flow velocity of the methane injection. And we, we, we made several LES to make sure that we are actually in the linear regime of the flame. Here on those two movies, you can see uh, the, the, the flame dynamics and the flow dynamics for two of those four LES. The first one is a low frequency forcing at 6 kHz, and the second one is a high frequency forcing at 16 kHz. The first observation here is that uh, as the acoustic waves that, uh, that we impose uh, exit the injector of methane, they are converted into vortex waves that you can see in green in, these two, in those two movies. Then those, uh, those vortex rings travel in the, in the methane jet, and when they pass near the flame, they induce uh, a fluctuating strain rate on the flame, which in turn produces fluctuation of heat release. Then we can see that the, the response pattern is very different uh, for low frequency forcing and a high frequency forcing. At high frequency, uh, both the velocity response and the flame response are, are directly located at the exit of the injector. At lower frequencies, both the, force, the velocity response and the flame response are shifted downstream, and they happen either closer to the middle of the flame or in the second half of the flame. To perform a more quantitative analysis of the flame dynamics, a common approach is to compute a flame transfer function, or FTF. But here, since the flame is, uh, is longer than typical flame, and since uh, the frequencies we are dealing with are very high, if you compute a high mass number based on those quantities, its value will be comprised between 0 and 6 and 1.2, which shows that the flame is not compact. So we cannot use the classical compacity assumption to define a FTF, which means that we have to define a new FTF that we call a local flame transfer function that depends on both the location along the flame, X, and the forcing frequency, F. So first, I'm recording the definition of the global FTF that is used for compact flames. So this global FTF relates the fluctuation, the global fluctuation of heat release to the fluctuations of velocity at the reference location. And it does that thanks to a global FTF gain, N, and a global FTF phase. And to compute this global FTF, we have to take into account the entire contribution of the flame. So both gain and phase depend only on the forcing frequency and do not depend on the location on the flame. Then I introduced the definition of a new FTF that we call local FTF and that is intended to deal with non-compact flames. So first, uh, I would like to emphasize that this is only one way to deal with non-compact flames. There are actually other ways to define local FTF, and for that, I refer you to the work of uh, Professor Sattermeyer from Tew Mansion and Professor Morgans from Imperial College. Here, uh, the definition of this uh, local FTF is intended to allow for direct comparison between the local FTF gain and the global FTF gain. So here we define this local FTF with this integral, where we have the local FTF gain and the local FTF phase that depend on both the location along the flame, x star, and f star, the forcing frequency. And we compute this local FTF by, taking the, by integrating 
the, the heat release fluctuations in a very thin slice of the flame at the location x dot. And one key property of this local FTF is that if the flame were compact, then the local FTF gain would be equal, equal to the classical uh, global FTF gain everywhere along the flame. So it allows for direct comparison between the two gains. So now I'll, I will present the, the local FTF uh, that we computed thanks to the set of, uh, of 16 forced LES. So we see here uh, the local gain, N, which is uh, represented in a two-dimensional space with on one axis the location along the flame and on the other axis the forcing frequency. The first observation on this local FTF gain is that uh, for high frequency forcing, uh, there is a region of strong response that is localized directly at the exit of the injector. Then, when we decrease the forcing frequency, this response region shifts downstream, and for low forcing frequency, it is localized in the second half of the flame. So that shows that there is a frequency-dependent preferential response region, and that also confirms that uh, the observation that we had on the movie of the flow patterns of the flame dynamics. In terms of order of magnitude, uh, the peaks of the local FGF gain uh, are reached at low frequencies and they reach values between 8 and 12. And as I explained before, this value of the local FGF gain can be directly compared to the global FGF gain that is usually, usually used for gaseous flames or compact flames, and for which we have values that typic typically range between 1 and 2. So that shows that uh, the, the local response of this liquid rocket engine flame is much stronger and much more intense than a, typical, than a typical compact gaseous flame. Then, if we, if we take a look at the, the local FGF phase, we see that uh, for all frequencies, it starts with, uh, with this linear region, where it depends linearly with respect to spatial location x. So that shows that, uh, that in this region, this linear region, there is a constant propagation speed. For instance, here at high frequency, uh, if we take the slope of this linear region, we can compute a propagation speed of the heat release disturbances along the flame, and uh, we find it to be equal to 1.2 times the bulk inflow velocity of methane. And because of this constant propagation speed in this linear region, uh, the, 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 the spatial fluctuation of, uh, of heat release are out of phase, so we have out of phase oscillations. At lower forcing frequency, we still have this linear region, but we see that here the slope is not so steep, and if we compute the propagation speed of the heat release disturbances along the flame, we find them to be equal to 0.3 times the bulk inflow velocity of methane, which shows that we have more in-phase oscillation of the, of the heat release fluctuations along the flame at low, low forcing frequency. And finally, we see that uh, after this, uh, this linear evolution of the phase with respect to the spatial location x along the flame, uh, the phase reaches a plateau in which it does not depend on, the, on x anymore. So in this plateau, uh, we have in-phase bulk flame oscillations. So that brings me to the, to the conclusion of the speech, and there are three points there that I would like to emphasize. The first one is that, is that the set of forced LES was very expensive to compute. It required about 90 million CPU hours, which were awarded by Praise, and uh, which were carried out on the supercomputers of GNC and TGCC. The second point is that uh, in this work, com we computed, thanks to those important computational resources, the first entire FTF of a liquid rocket engine flame with liquid oxygen and liquid methane. So this was the first in the world of numerical combustion. The FTF data that we computed are free available and can be downloaded uh, from the supplemental mater material of the article. The analysis of the FTF showed that there is a frequency-dependent preferential response region of the heat release fluctuations and also of the, of the vortex rings in the methane stream. Finally, there is a third point that uh, I don't have time to, to present in this speech because of time constraints, is that we, we conducted a theoretical analysis of the contributions to the heat release fluctuations to identify the physical mechanism driving those oscillations. And we found that most of, most of heat release fluctuations are coming from the fluctuations of species diffusivity. Then there are two secondary contributors which are the fluctuations of the flame surface area, as well as the fluctuations of the mixture fraction gradient. I invite you to check out the paper to see the details of this uh, theoretical analysis, because I believe it has the potential to guide the future development of analytical FGF models for liquid rocket engine flames.
So now I would like to, to thank you for your attention. I would like to wish you a good symposium.